So today's topic is uh, using salt as an ingredient in cheese making, and it's a very important ingredient. It provides several functions, and in my opinion, it's very difficult to make good tasting cheese without enough salt. I don't know if anybody's tasted low salt cheeses, but they can't be aged for very long. It's generally delegated to the fresh, short age cheese category uh, if cheese makers are gonna do it. And um, therefore today, what we're talking about is um, more cheeses that the salt is the back, one of the backbones of the flavor development. So it's also acts as a preservative uh, just in the way that meat is cured with salt, cheese needs salt for its preservation and to maintain its quality during aging or storage. Uh, salt slows bacterial growth somewhat, so it's effective in preventing cheese from spoiling. It discourages the growth of contaminating microorganisms, things that you don't want to be established in your cheese or on the Rhine, you can use salt as a means to discourage them. And finally, removal of moisture, yeah, flavor development. That you cannot get, as I said earlier, the true flavor of the cheese, I don't believe will come out unless it is, um, you're going to incorporate enough salt into it. And I'm still not able to, move these slides forward. Okay. I'm not really sure what's going on. There we go. But, oh, oh, okay, we're, I just jumped ahead a bunch of them. Oh, sorry, did you? Um, Hang on, we'll go back yeah, up. Yeah, we're... Wait, tell me when to stop. You've done that one. Uh, no, next, yep, there we go. So let's go through the things I just talked about, the five functions that I believe uh, you can narrow down salt to. Uh, as a preservative function, it really does inhibit gas producing bacteria. These would be uh, bacteria that produce carbon dioxide during aging and without enough salt, particularly in cheeses that don't have enough acidity, uh, you're going to get a considerable amount of carbon dioxide. And it may be a good tasting cheese, albeit very sweet, but it's probably what you don't want. So. Trying to get enough salt in there is very important. Secondly, there's definitely a uh, well-known phenomenon in cheese aging where if you have made a cheese that's uh, low in salt, it will tend to go bitter. If you combine that low salt with a uh, higher than average moisture for the cheese you're making, you will most likely notice some bitterness developing within the first three months of aging that cheese. So ultimately its preservative function is to maintain proper flavor and texture in cheese. In terms of flavor development, um, as I, I just said a couple times, you're not going to really get the true flavor of the cheese without enough salt. So the cheese will lack flavor. Often if you've entered a cheese in a contest, you'll get a uh, back on your score sheet, something like lax flavor. And that could be an indicator that you should up your salt content. So that'd be a good thing to remember for those of you that are trying to bring out more flavor, the real flavor of the cheese, but also do better in competitions. Um, if you add too much salt, it's gonna really slow the development down and the cheese texture as well, uh, slow the flavor development down, but the texture as well, will tend to be more what we call woody or tough, and it won't break down as rapidly and get to that creamy quality that you know people enjoy eating cheese because it's easier to chew through it. Uh, however, when you th think about flavor and salt's role in flavor development, people do have different thresholds for the saltiness of a cheese. And so it can be kind of frustrating at times when you're trying to get your business off the ground and try to hit that sweet spot for the salt level to, uh, to find that. Because uh, you yourself, like me, for example, when I started doing cheese, I, I actually like saltier cheeses and I would often make cheeses too salty for the general public. So I had to learn how to 
tailor the cheeses for the consumer rather than myself. <laughs> uh, but if I had lived in the Balkans, it wouldn't have been a problem because they uh, eat lots of saltier foods there. Um, the third function would be slowing bacterial growth. Certainly, if you combine salting with cooling down of the cheese, we are going to uh, consider that to be the circuit breaker of the lactic acid fermentation. And so, therefore, no more acidity is developing and the cheese can begin to, uh, either as a fresh cheese, you get it on the market, or um, for an aging process, now you're beginning to move into different biochemical reactions and uh, bringing about the flavor and texture of the cheese that you're trying to make. The other aspect of slowing bacterial growth is there are some pathogens that don't tolerate salt very well. And so even at the average level, like in a cheddar, which is around 1.75% salt, they're not gonna uh, be able to hang on and survive very well. The one pathogen that does uh, tolerate salt well is listeria, monocytogenes. So that's a good thing to remember that you're not gonna control all of them, but you will control uh, some of them like salmonella, for example. Uh, the fourth function would be discouraging contaminants. And these could just be benign type uh, microbes. They're, they're not going to make anyone sick if they grow. But say you're trying to make a blue cheese and you don't have enough salt inside. Well, instead of getting a pure culture of blue mold growing in there, you may get some yeast growing. You may get some, you know, undesirable types of uh, flavors developing unless you have enough salt to promote that blue mold to spread far and wide around in the cheese. And also salt discourages other molds from growing on cheese rinds. So if you're, um, if you're salting uh, fairly often um, to do surface salting of, on a bigger cheese, you'll notice that uh, the molds don't really get established till the, you stop salting and then the rind begins to dry out somewhat. Um, and uh, uh, finally, we have the ability of salt to remove moisture. So that is dehydration. It's basically just sucking the residual moisture out of the cheese. And this is also the beginning of how a rind begins to form. And it'll happen either by surface salting or by brining because of the concentration on the rind, the salt concentration on the rind, you're going to get uh, a toughening out there and it'll end up protecting the rest of the cheese. So next slide we'll move on to. Okay, so the order of salt to tolerance for microbes is very important to uh, investigate and remember that if here we have the first one is the mucor mold and you can see the picture of that fuzzy gray mold in French called the cat hair, poids de chat. And that's very, can be very common kind of contaminant on cheeses that are surface salted or, or brine that are soft ripened, like the nice camembert in the upper picture. That's what you want to see. But if you don't get enough salt, perhaps you can see since it grows at a, uh, a very low salt tolerance, you might end up seeing the mucor spreading around on your rind. I remember when I used to make a lot of brie and camembert, we did surface salting with a shaker and rolling the sides on a salt that was spread out on a tray. And if we were kind of sloppy about it and didn't really get certain spots salted, we would get tufts of mucor sprouting up. So that I'll never forget that one. And as you can see, as we move up through the uh, different microbes that are important for, for cheese, we can see how uh, as we move from the yeast uh, up into the uh, back, yeast and molds up into the bacteria, we get to the higher level of salt tolerance. And so uh, blue mold, of course, will tolerate a higher salt. So it's good to get enough salt in when you're making blue cheese. But also with washed rind type cheeses that you're using salt as an aging uh, uh, ingredient. So you're actually making a solution of salt water and maybe adding ripening cultures to it, you, you need to get a certain buildup of salt on the rind. 
to establish that orange kind of bacteria. Next right. one. Next one, yeah. Just am I just yeah, there we go. Micro. Yeah. So um the uh the um important thing to remember about continuing this little part about the salt tolerance is that um you want to try to select for the things that uh, are going to grow that are going to be helpful to create good interior texture and then develop the flavor. And so if you want to encourage that open type texture where you have gas bubbles of carbon dioxide in the paste, the interior, you're not going to want to make too salty of a cheese. You're going to want to try to go like with a Swiss cheese, think, think of an Emmentaler cheese. These are cheeses that probably have the lowest salt levels of, of the cheeses, uh, you know, the grand, uh, grand uh, variety of cheeses. The, uh, they might have as low as half a percent salt, certainly not higher than 1%. And then when you have a cheese like that where the salt has been homogeneously distributed throughout the cheese, so you have to put the cheese through a process of, of, uh, of being in a cold room as the salt is absorbed. And when it finally does, then you can subject that cheese to a warmer temperature. And because of the even spread of salt at this low level, those propionic bacteria will begin to produce the carbon dioxide and you'll get the nice bubbles. In Gouda cheese, the same thing, but it's, you know, it's the, uh, uh, Leuconostoc mesternitoides bacteria or the Lactococcus diacetylactus bacteria growing and producing the uh, CO2 in those cheeses. So in either case, you can't have cheese that's too salty. If you, you just can't do that with a cheddar cheese. Cheddar cheese isn't supposed to get gassy. So uh, that's an important thing to remember. And then as I keep referring to blue cheese, it actually is very important to get uh, sufficient salt distributed through the cheese to select for the blue mold and prevent other kinds of organisms from growing. And finally, when you think about the breakdown of protein during the aging of cheese, there's a certain stage early on, like within the first month or two, where you can have bitterness developing, the, and it, it, it can be a thing that goes away by the third month if you have sufficient salt. And that's because um, you're gonna stimulate the bacteria that produce amino peptidases that will break down these bitter peptides. If those bacteria can't outgrow bacteria that um, are producing the, these uh, shorter chain peptides uh, from the caseins, uh, then you're gonna end up with a lot of bitterness. The bacteria that are stimulated and produce amino peptidases can break down those shorter chain peptides into even smaller molecules and then the bitterness goes away. So I always say that if you've got a little bitterness developing in your cheese, don't just give up on it until it's over three months old. If it's still there after three months, I would not be too happy about that and not be very confident that that bitterness would go away. But certainly it is part of the cascade of, of uh, protein breakdown in the early stages of aging a cheese. And then secondly, what grows best is important for rind development. And the longer the um, salt is on the surface of the cheese, so the, the longer you spread out that salting, like especially for bigger cheeses, you have to, if you're going to surface salt them, you're going to have to have them on, you know, salt on the surface for quite a while. You're not going to see much mold growing. You're going to select for, uh, for coriniform bacteria and yeast by doing this kind of salty rind approach. And uh, that's really classic in alpine, hard alpine cheese aging. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Next one. Next one, yep. Yeah. Next thing I want to talk about is um, something that I'm not, still not moving this along. That's it. Ta I can't see. There we go. Uh, 
is um, just something I learned actually in, in school at the University of Vermont from my professor, Dr. Kinstep. He uh, introduced me to this concept of salt and moisture. And so you can think about water and cheese, right? Think about all the components that are in a cheese. Water is generally um, is, uh, going to exist in two states. It's either going to be bound to the proteins or it's going to be free water that's available for microbial reactions. So this is where the bacteria move around in the free water and they can, you know, their enzymatic activity can be expressed by snipping off at the proteins or, or uh, breaking down the fats. And so over time you start to develop the flavor. Uh, you've got minerals dissolved in the water phase of the cheese. You've got the residual lactose that will be used up over time. And so all this stuff exists in that free water. Also, the salt that you added by brining the cheese or directly salting the curds or surface salting is going to end up in the free water. And so basically we have a brine solution uh, is what the water, most of the water in the cheese is in a brine solution, and we call that salt and moisture. And so it is what, go, it's a quality control parameter. It has a large effect on cheese quality, and um, it's what uh, governs microbial activity. You can calculate this if you know the moisture content of your cheese and the salt percentage of your cheese. So you just take the percent salt. So say in cheddar, we have a 1.5% salt, and you divide that by the moisture content, which is uh, plus the salt percentage. So let's say we have a cheddar that's 36%. We add the one and a half to it. So we have one and a half divided by 37 and a half. We get somewhere around um, four to 5% salt and moisture. Yeah, don't forget to multiply that, what I just said, times 100 to get the percent salt and moisture. But it's a very good thing to just investigate as a cheesemaker learning the craft. Oh, I wonder what the salt and moisture is for cheddar. What is it for Gouda? What, what are the known values of salt and moisture that produce a really good cheese, a cheese that doesn't have bitterness, that develops its flavor properly? And so, and you know, to end up that, the thinking on salt and moisture, um, remember that it is just a measure of the brine strength of the water phase of the cheese and so it goes a little beyond just thinking of what percent salt my cheese has really thinking about how well that briny stuff controls the uh, aging process it can it can have a pretty big range uh, from pretty low like for swiss at two percent up to eight percent for some blue cheeses so this is not the percent salt this is the concentration of salt in the brine and the free water of the cheese. Next slide. Yep. Now I want to move on to talking about the different methods of salting that are available to us. And you guys really inspired me with this topic. I, uh, I hadn't really thought about this salting in as far in depth as I did to make this presentation and um, realize that there's actually a lot of different ways that cheesemakers incorporate salt into their cheese. And so the first one would be, we're gonna go through these one by one, but I'll just run down the list. Direct salting of whey and curds, like when you're making Havarti cheese, and there are also some blue cheese recipes. There are some other Scandinavian cheeses like Havarti where salt may be added as you're stirring the whey and curds together. Secondly, we've got direct salting of curds. This would be for milled curd type cheeses, cheddar types specifically, where you've already fermented the curds and now you're gonna dress them with salt, stir it in, let them mellow a bit, and then press those salted curds into wheels or blocks, whatever you're gonna do for a shape. The third method would be direct salting of lactic curd cheeses. And this I've done myself when I worked at a larger company making lots of chev fresh goat's milk cheese we actually put the salt right into the the fermented curd in the vat and mixed it up like a slurry the fourth method would be surface salting and this is real common um, a lot of people salt their cheese this way i'd say 
uh, let's see, at Perishable Creamery, we make nine cheeses and one, two, two of them are brined and all the rest are surface salted. So even though we often cheese makers think of, you know, the European style cheeses, oh, well, they, they go in brines. Well, especially for smaller format cheeses, we're going to be surface salting will be more common as a traditional method. Then we get on to brining and we can even think about brining as an aging uh, technique for like for feta. And finally, uh, we can think about how brines and salt solutions are used during affinage, the aging of the cheese. So let's move on and take a look at these one by one. Uh, so the first one, and I just put down Northern European cheeses because these are the most familiar, the ones I'm most familiar with where they use this technique of direct salting whey and curds. So I'm just going to, it's a little dull here. I'm going to have to read this. But uh, um, anyways, salt is added during the stirring process. So this is after the whey has been taken out to remove that some of the lactose. And then you've, you're adding this warm water, hot water, to then uh, bring the level of liquid back up to where it was. So you're replacing the way you removed with the water. Now the water's in and you've done that step. Now it's time to add salt. And the typical amount is, is about 0.2%. So it's 200 grams for every 100 liters. But it can vary from 100 to 600, depending on the uh, desire of the cheesemaker for making that cheese. It's added to the whey and curds at least 15 to 20 minutes before you end stirring. So you want to make sure that the salt is in contact uh, with the solution. It's in the solution being dissolved and moving its way into the curds uh, so that it'll do the job. So putting in that much salt doesn't slow the acidification. So there's no uh, direct effect on the lactic acid producing bacteria. Um, it does promote moisture retention in the curds and this is because um, the sodium exchanges with calcium during the, uh, that stirring out with the salt after it's been added. The curds will lose less moisture during the cooking of the vat. You'll end up with a higher moisture cheese. And so when we think of a Gouda versus a Havarti, you can see how that works. Havarti is a higher moisture. It's a creamier cheese. And this is a, a way to retain more moisture during that kind of a make process. Um, so what happens is as the sodium exchanges with calcium, the calcium content is lowered in the curd, and that may, makes the curd less firm, more flexible, so you've got that creaminess being established. Ultimately, when you, these, these Northern European cheeses are typically brined, and so we're going to be reducing the brining time, maybe by half, by 25%, uh, so that we're 50 to 75% less time uh, in the brine. She's around 50, 75. Well, it, it shouldn't, can we go back up? Okay. It, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be thinking about this as three quarters less time in the brine. What I meant by this was you may brine it a quarter less to a half less is what I was trying to uh, get across with that. So don't get confused. Maybe jot down a note because it seems a little confusing. So what I'm trying to say is you, may, you will end up brining the cheese less because it's already got some salt in it, and that could be about a quarter to a half less time. All right, now we can go to the next one. So that, then we can think about, uh, th there's a, a recipe here that I, was look, uh, I use sometimes when I teach workshops where it's, they developed it out in Iowa, um, and it is known as Iowa blue cheese, and they will add salt to the whey and curds there as well. Uh, this is to keep the curds more buoyant and, and help to prevent them from matting so that there's more spaces between the curds for that blue mold to grow. Um, you get firmer curds, they don't distort as much, and then uh, you get a better result with getting a good growth of blue mold throughout, especially when you're doing blue cheeses where you want that early growth of blue and you want to have a considerable amount of blue in there so you can get the cheese aging and get it on the market. Like a lot of the blues that I'm familiar with, 
they're on the market when they're three months old. And that's a lot different kind of uh, approach than what we do at Parish Hill, which is making cheese with milled curds that aren't direct salted, that, you know, we surface salt the cheese and then uh, age it for quite a while. So this is more like, uh, I'm familiar more with like a, more of a younger type blue cheese, trying to get it on the market at a younger age. So after you've drained off whey equal to 40% of your milk weight, so say you had 1,000 pounds of milk, you would drain off 400 pounds of whey. Then you've got this slurry and you add the salt at a rate of 0.6% of the original milk weight. So like three times more than in the Havarti make. And you add that salt in and then you stir it in again, give yourself 15 minutes so that you get the salt to do its job. And then you end up with a salt content of 0.6 to 0.8% in a one day old cheese. So bingo, you've already got salt in the cheese and that aids in the growth of the blue mold. That whole thing, purpose of this being to get a cheese that will blue quickly and you can get it on the market sooner. Yeah. So uh, the third, let's see, yeah, on the third one. Uh, so this would be uh, direct salting of curds. And this is for milled curd type cheeses. And what comes to mind for me is uh, either cheddar types, um, so Great Britain, and Stilton, of course, is a milled curd uh, blue, and they salt it right after milling. Or here, you know, in the States, Wisconsin, uh, even up in Canada and Quebec, uh, very popular thing to eat are fresh cheddar curds. And so the curds are salted in the vat, and they are left to mellow a bit. They're bagged up, and then they're sold. So that's uh, another thing I thought of. So the, the curds are, are added, uh, I mean the salt, not the curds. This is a typo, I should say salt is added after the lacto-fermentation is almost finished. So, uh, so make sure you take a note of that. Uh, I apologize for that typo. Um, and so we're going to have a range like pH 4.8 would be more for Stilton, pH 5.35 for cheddar. So somewhere in that range is when you're going to be milling and then putting the salt on. That helps draw the final whey out of the curds and the salt is quickly incorporated into the cheese. And then you get this homogeneous salt distribution through the cheese within one day after you've gotten it you know, into the hoops and on the press. So it's really uh, um, a very rapid way to get salt incorporated into a cheese. Next slide. Yep. If we're talking about the direct salting of the lactic curd, we're gonna ferment that curd. This is for making chev or fromage blanc or something like that, a fresh brebi, sheep cheese. You're going to get the curd fermented to pH 4.60 or less. And then you're going to pour the salt on top of the curd as the curd is being stirred up in the vat. And what the way we used to do it was we would add 1.2% or one pound of salt to every 10 gallons of curd. And we'd mix that up to make a slurry and then drain that in cheesecloth bags. And the place I worked at was fairly industrial. It, you know, we did uh, 2,500 gallons of milk into chev in a typical run, a manufacturing day. So that, you know, worked really well in, in, in that um, situation. But you can also do this on a small scale. You know, I know people who do this in much more modest sized companies, and it's a very effective way to incorporate the salt into the cheese and then avoid having to surface salt the lactic cheeses or mix it into the curd after you've drained it. So just remember that, you know, this is not necessarily an industrial technique. It's just a, a, another way perhaps to salt a lactic type cheese. Surface salting, very, very common uh, technique. Of course, this would have been the first way that cheese was ever salted before 
people discovered making brines. Here it's really important to think about the, the grade of salt, the grind, if you will. And you got to use flake salt. Uh, you don't want to use a really coarse salt for the small format cheeses. You want to use a fine flake salt, like a kosher salt is what I usually make an analogy to the kosher salt you buy in the, the store. Um, the, w the salt that we get that comes from Maine, we have a choice of either a fine flake, which they've sifted out the coarser grains, uh, or a coarse grain. So we get both for different purposes. The coarse is used for hard alpine cheeses or to surface salt cheeses that are in the brine so it doesn't absorb as fast. The fine flake is still big enough that it absorbs slowly and absorbs perfectly into these smaller cheeses or like, uh, you know, we do the blue as well, four, four salting spread out over a week. And the salt absorbs more quickly than the coarse, but at the right rate. That's the whole thing about choosing the right grade or grind of salt is that absorption rate is what you're thinking about. Um, and if you use fine salt to do this, I would not be surprised if your cheese is too salty. It's very hard to control the salt uptake if you surface salt cheese with fine salt, like table salt or pickling salt. So I would avoid that. I would make brines out of those kind of salts, but I would not use them for surface salting. Uh, next slide. So the number of saltings depends on the thickness of the cheese. Uh, brie only being an inch or a little over an inch thick just needs one salting on the cheese. So one surface gets salted, the sides, that gets absorbed in a few hours. You flip it over and you salt the other side. You're done. The gorgonzola style blue that we make that's very similar in size to the real deal in Italy. It's about a 16 to 18 pound wheel. And we do four saltings. We might even do five on the really big ones. Um, and so we have to spread that out every other day so the salt has enough time to absorb fully. And so it can take a week. It does take a week for us to salt that cheese. It's that big. So the general rule of thumb is salt the cheese one time for every three to four pounds of weight. But also think about how thick it is. And if, they're, if you're doing a great big like Grand Brie that weighs, you know, more like, I think they weigh more like five pounds, you're still only going to salt it once. This kind of salting is required for certain French Appalachian origin controlé cheeses and also the designated origin protection, the protected cheeses of Italy and, and Spain maybe. But you'll find this in their rules of production where they require surface salting and they won't allow brining. And this, again, gets back to making sure that the right microbes develop on the rind to create the old world cheeses and maintain that tradition that they're trying to do with these rules of production. It's a very important part of the process. And then let's take a look at some uh, surface salting on the hard alpine cheeses on the next slide. So in this case, it's really an interesting uh, technique. And we do this at Parish Hill Creamery for one cheese we make. And I really enjoy making this cheese, actually, because it's so much fun to see how the schmear, as the Swiss call it, that sticky bacterial rind and yeast are also part of that rind, starts to develop. And you start with this, like, you know, paler young cheese, and you're sprinkling a little bit of coarse salt, just like, a teaspoon and you're spreading it out over the surface and then the, it's going to dissolve very slowly overnight. The next day you rub that briny stuff into the rind. And you'll notice in the beginning it absorbs into the cheese somewhat, you know, because it's also getting the cheese, the salt into the cheese. It's not just to develop the rind. You're also salting your cheese. But over time, which can take up to a month of this process, you'll notice that the rind gets that sticky smear on it and it becomes uh, much easier to rub the salty stuff around on the rind. And then ultimately, after up to about a month, it's done. And then you're not going to keep putting salt on all the time. 
you might be wiping the rind down with a brine, uh, but just light, lightly, you know, just to prevent molds from growing on it. So you can see in the two pictures, we've got, you know, me rubbing it in, and then the cheese in the bottom picture where it's almost done. And you can see the, the change in the color on the rind there. Okay, next one. Let's move on to talking about brining. This is going to be a, a, a good section. Uh, I'll take a few minutes here, several minutes. Um, it's, it's really common to, I mean, most cheesemakers I know have brines. They maintain brines. It can replace surface salting of small format cheeses even. When you have these deep brine tanks with special racking systems and you can pick up a whole batch of camembert and you can lower it into these deep brine tanks for like 30 minutes and then pull them all out and boom, you're done. You don't have to hand salt each, each uh, piece of cheese. There are also automated machines that are used to um, do surface salting. So that process could be speeded up in these larger company, companies that can afford those kinds of machines. But brining is really what I've seen more common in the U.S. I know that in Quebec and in France, they have specials like salt spraying kind of machines that, that will uh, salt the, the small format cheeses. But um, saturated brines, um, really because they're so high in salt, Nothing can grow in there, and it helps prevent contamination. Um, if you're if you're not you know diligent about surface salting these bigger cheeses and just sort of let them and skip a few days and stuff like that, you're not going to have a you're going to get contaminants, and you're not going to be controlling the development of the rind too well. So, it's a cheese sitting hanging out in brine like these wheels of of Brebis Tom, they're going to be pretty well protected while they're in the brine as long as the cheesemaker's turning them over and keeping salt on the surface, as you can see in the picture. What we want to get is at least 18% salt uh, content, and this is equivalent to 80% of saturation. If you're measuring by a hydrometer, you're going to be measuring percent saturation. So either way you go with a salt brine meter, you want to be above 18%. With a uh, hydrometer, you want to be above 80% saturation. Right. So uh, during brining, some whey is released into the brine. This is why brines change color and get more green. If you're putting uh, warm cheese into cold brine, because brines have to be kept in a cool place, if you're doing that as a regular practice, you're going to notice that the, the brines will start gaining volume. They're gonna, you're going to have to empty some of it out. And... Uh, you know, you're getting more and more whey in there. So it's probably better to move your cheeses into the um, aging room, the brining, I mean the brining room, the area where your brines are, and let them cool down to, to the same temperature as the room, the brine, before you put them in. And that will help reduce the amount of whey being released into the brine. And uh, you won't be losing as much moisture out of your cheese either. So something else that happens during brining is the salt is concentrated on the surface and that helps to start creating the rind of the cheese. So let's think about how we make brine. Any grade of non-iodized salt can be used. Uh, like I said, it can be fine salt to coarse salt. It's best to do it in warm water or warm acidified way at about a pH 4.50 I mean, 4.5 to 5.0, you just take some acidified whey that you've held overnight and you add that enough salt to reach saturation. Or it's very common. I worked in Macedonia and Bulgaria a little bit, um, Albania, and over there they do a lot of feta. And it was very common to age the feta uh, in a salt brine solution that was only 8 to 10%, and it was made from the acidified whey from that batch of cheese that they made and they would just you know have a process of getting that salt in and then the cheese would be put in there and they would age in that till they sold them three plus months later um, alternatively i know some cheesemakers here in the states that just use whey and put salt in it and it works very well because the, the whey has got calcium in it, the whey is acidified and it's in equilibrium with the cheese if you want to do it from water you're going to have to 
go with this recipe I, I put on the um, slide. And what's worked out very well for me has been just as you can read right there, one gallon water plus two and a half to three pounds of salt. The reason why you have a range of salt is, is like kosher salt, I found you need more than uh, just uh, refined salt. And then also sea salts that aren't refined, I'm also finding out I need to use more to make up saturation, just because it's not pure sodium chloride. In addition to the salt, you're gonna be adding a tablespoon of calcium chloride to this gallon of water and enough vinegar. And on the average, it's about a teaspoon of vinegar to reach a pH of 4.5 to 5.0. But just remember that water acidity varies and you can have harder, softer water. And so do have a pH meter, do be uh, measuring that pH as you add the vinegar to get to the, where you're gonna reach the equilibrium in chemistry of what a cheese would have. That's why we do this. And that helps to prevent the rinds from getting soft and slimy during brining. The last thing is to maintain the brine at 45 to 55 degrees during uh, the, the whole time. And that way the cheese will absorb uh, salt at the right rate. And I'm gonna show you on the next slide my little formula rule of thumb that I use for brining time. So it really does depend on the thickness, weight, and moisture content of the cheese. But the rule of thumb would be take the inches thick that the cheese is, this is for semi-hard and hard cheeses, and multiply that by the pounds that the cheese weighs, and that will give you the hours the cheese should spend in the brine. So I did a little example of a four inch thick Gouda that weighs 22 pounds, therefore that cheese would need 88 hours in the brine. But this is all based on making sure you have at least 18% salt in the brine, okay? And so when you're, you're talking about cheeses that are higher in moisture, I would be reducing that time to half to three quarters to make sure they don't get too salty. And, and on the other hand, if the cheeses are very hard, like grana styles, you may need to go longer to control that gas formation uh, from happening in the cheese. I found that in my own cheese making that with the milk I'm working with, I got to really, I got to go like one and a half times that rule of thumb for a hard Romano uh, Parmigiano cheese, or else they tend to turn into more like Emmentaler cheese, which is very interesting <laughs> to see how the chemistry just governs it all. Um, but ultimately, brining times can be very subjective. When I start to talk shop with other cheese makers, I realize that everybody doesn't follow this same rule of thumb. And, you know, it's, it really comes down to what works for you. I'm just giving you a guideline here. So next one. And we're going to look at the procedure, um, good procedures for brining. Keep separate brines for pasteurized and raw milk cheeses at all times. Don't do any crossover or you might contaminate because uh, these raw milk cheeses have not been aged 60 days. They're just going right into the brine. And, you know, you, from a food safety aspect, this is just not a good idea. Something that you should always keep the brine separate. The cheeses should be floating loosely in the brine. They should always be floating because it's high salt, but they should not be packed tightly or wherever they're touching each other, they're not going to be absorbing salt. And interestingly enough, you can get little domes of gas developing on the cheese rinds later as they're aging. Uh, what I like to do if, if I want to really put a lot of cheese in a brine tank is I'll use uh, drain matting like pla uh, excuse me, plastic matting or a stainless steel kind of grid to separate the layers of wheels of cheese and that way they're not touching and I can put considerable amount of cheese in by pressing down the cheese underneath in layers. Uh, it's good to sprinkle coarse flake salt on the top layer of cheese and uh, um, turn the, that top layer over halfway through the brining and for cheeses that have to be in the brine for more than a day, every day. Now, alternatively, you could get yourself a, a heavier stainless steel grid or plastic grid and put that on top of all the cheeses in the brine and then kind of push them down under the brine and lock that in place. And that way you wouldn't have to flip over the top layer. I've seen people do that. So that's, a, that's kind of a 
nifty way to go if, uh, if you want to do that. For maintaining brine, we're going to always be skimming out particles of curd. We're going to be mixing the brine up on a regular basis whenever there's not cheese in there, checking the concentration at least every week. We're going to wipe the sides down to remove any contaminating yeast and molds that are going to definitely develop in that interface where there's air and there's that you know cheesy briny stuff. Um, over time, um, you're going to get some cheesy stuff building up in the brine, especially when softer cheeses are brined. And so one little trick I learned from French cheesemakers was we can use our titratable acidity, that acidometer, take your sample of brine and titrate it just like you would whey or milk. And if you're above 0.4% titratable acidity, it's time to change the brine or filter it and pasteurize it to preserve it and bring it back into uh, being a safe place to age cheese. Another thing I know cheesemakers do fairly often is send out samples of the brine to have a past pathogen screen done on it. Um, I'm really keyed into our, the brines by odor. I'm always like making sure they smell good, trying to keep them nice and clean. And mo everything I brine is very smooth, hard pressed kind of cheese. And so I've been maintaining my brines for, for several years without any increase in the TA, without any kind of problem with pathogens. So it really gets down to what kind of cheese you're, you're putting through there and how often you might want to uh, think about changing the brine or going through a preservation. Now let's move on to the final way we use salt and that would be uh, during the affinage process. And of course this is a topic for a completely different presentation. And that's why I'm not going to spend much time on it. I just wanted to put a few bullet points on there to get you thinking about, you know, salt really is a very important ingredient in developing a cheese rind. We use it all the time in washed rind cheese making. Some cheese makers even make uh, beer, salty beer or wine solutions and float the cheeses in them. And of course, keeping the salt on the rind encourages yeast and bacteria to grow and discourages molds. So that's the whole point with washed rind cheeses is to get, not have molds growing on the rind. And last, think about um, where your salt is gonna come from. Uh, that hoop house picture with the dry salt in that, that uh, shallow pan is, is a shot from the main sea salt company where we get our salt and they'll scoop that stuff up and bring it up to where they dry, do the final drying on it, and then bag it up and send it to us. Or maybe you're gonna get salt from a mine. And this slide I took from a nice website about the uh, Bex salt mines in uh, uh, Switzerland, which is, you guys should check it out, it's really fun. And if you're ever in Switzerland, you can go there and take the little train down into the salt mines. I'm gonna do that someday. Uh, the, I already talked about the grades of salt, the, or the grinds. So I think I'm just going to leave you thinking about uh, your, uh, your source of the salt you're going to use for your cheese making. And then finally, just a little bit about what we do on Parish Hill Creamery. Up on Parish Hill, we're, uh, I'm going to leave you this, you know, so you have it with your PDF. You just see that we're very traditional in the way we approach making our cheese. We're able to make everything from raw milk. We're able to make the cultures from raw milk to ferment the, the sugars to make the lactic acid. And we really just want to make sure that what we're doing is, uh, is um, expressing the taste of the place we live in. So we feel like we can do it most effectively by using that salt from the coast of Maine, which back in the day, 100 years ago, that's where cheesemakers got their salt from coastal salt makers all along the, uh, the Atlantic. And then finally, we've got our last project. I was talking a bit about that cheese earlier. And we just want, we feel like this is a great vehicle to help other American cheesemakers explore a fundamental or elemental approach to cheesemaking and bring out the real taste of the place of uh, in the cheese. But how does environmental humidity affect surface salting? 
the surface salt absorbs moisture and develops a stickiness. Does this need to be managed in a particular way? Yes, I would say that you want to avoid very high humidity. I, I like relative humidities of around 90% to get cheese going. Uh, later on, once the rind's established, I, I, might, um, I might go higher. Uh, but certainly, if I'm, when I'm surface salting the cheese just to incorporate the salt, I'd want around a 90 per, 85 to 90 seems to work good for those alpine ones to make sure there's always a little bit of brine on the surface. Um, it won't dry out too much. So actually, I would say right around 90 is good for that. But for cheeses that you're not, that you're, you know, you're salting for just one to say, you know, handful of days, to get the salt in and you're not trying to develop the smear, I would say, you know, you're more like in, in a brining room environment. You may be around 80% relative humidity on the low, but you certainly don't want it to be too dry or the cheeses will just be drying out during the salting process. So it can vary depending on how big the cheese is and what your goal is, right? That's really the key. So, but somewhere between 80 and 90, I think is going to be ideal. And the lower for the smaller cheese. The lower for the smaller, the higher for the bigger. Yeah. pH meters. Any advice on quality for choosing them for a small scale production? Don't go on the cheap, I'm yep. afraid to say. I mean, think yeah. about it. You're a cheesemaker. What are the, you only have two instruments that you rely on. You need something to measure acidity, and that's generally pH meter, and you have a thermometer. So you might, as well get really good ones. Yep. Uh, we spent $500 on ours. Um, it, it has a detachable probe. So if the probe wears out, which they do about every three years, you can buy a new one for, for less than 200 Or even, I think we have a, one we like a lot that was, well, yeah. But anyways, I, I would say spending around that much is, is where you should be at. You should, you should uh, expect to, get a high quality if, if instrument. You, if you have a group of cheesemakers that, that can suggest what they like.